Uh, welcome everybody to our uh, webinar series in uh, uh, Enables. So today we have the RF and inductive energy harvesting. Um, and uh, we would like to present the following topics here, starting with a short introduction of Enables and then going into detail of uh, inductive energy harvesting with the principle, a little bit theory and uh, formulas behind it. Here are the two principles of uh, yeah, aligned coils, the uh, principle known also from the RFID and also the transformer, then the RF uh, energy harvesting um, with radiated um, um, electromagnetic field that will be explained by Mammoth and then electrodynamic harvesting uh, from Peter as the third main part of today. And then we will have these questions and answers. Um, yeah, for you, feel free to uh, answer us as much as you can. And uh, short introdu uh, introduction of us, of us, the speakers. On the uh, left picture, we have Mahmoud Waki. He uh, from University Southampton. Um, he's working of uh, RF power transfer and antenna design. He will explain today also a little bit of his areas of um, uh, wrecked antennas and uh, RF energy transfer. On the right hand side, we have uh, Peter Spies from uh, Fraunhofer um, ISS. He is uh, yeah, in the department of um, self-powered radio system. And uh, he is a coordinator in the business field IoT system. And um, by myself, um, Gerd von Bögel. I'm from Fraunhofer IMS, uh, Microelectronic Circuit and Systems. They are the head of the business field industry and doing their, um, yeah, the uh, IoT development in some areas, of course, using energy harvesting. Um, yeah, so far. Let's begin with a few words about enables. Um, yeah, here you see we will have a trillion of IoT devices by 2025. That's uh, amazing. That's really a lot. We cannot imagine what that needs, <laughs> what that is. Um, all these devices, um, but uh, what we want to do, where we are standing for, is what, what can we do to uh, yeah, replace, where possible, the batteries. Uh, you know, um, yeah, it's an uh, 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 um, uh, uh, catastrophe for our environment if we are using batteries for all these uh, devices, so we have to do what we what's possible to avoid this um, and to use uh, uh, energy harvesting. So this is the uh, industry challenge from the research uh, search excellence uh, challenge. We have to yeah we have to network. We have to bring together all the stakeholders of uh, these technologies um, for this goal, avoiding these uh, yeah batteries and uh, powering. Um, the IoT devices. Here we should get uh, together the academic and industry developers uh, to push um, the technologies for, for energy harvesting and the things around. And also doing um, the acceleration of this process to bring it in faster, as fast as pot possible to market. So uh, there are all the topics here, standard, uh, standardization and interoperability what are also necessary for this work. Um, yeah, uh, Enables itself is a 5.2 million euro research infrastructure pro uh, project. Um, so we are cre creating self-sustaining energy solutions to power the internet of things based on these topics given here, the energy harvest, uh, energy harvesting, uh, the storage, uh, the micro power management, system integration, all these activities together with in detail, uh, Niklas uh, mentioned it already that we providing a fast track to nearly everybody uh, to help to bring these technologies to market. 
Um, then we're do, uh, doing also uh, joint research activities. There we are working together on special <laughs> topics guided for, by, by needs and opportunities uh, also in this area. Then uh, creating libraries, for example, uh, yeah, some uh, special things and tools um, for optimizing uh, on all level, system level and also device level. And uh, not, uh, not the last thing is the starting community. So we see us as a starting community within Enables together with you to bring up this to, uh, technology. So um, uh, post, uh, important is to mention this transnational um, access program, what we are having. So uh, here you can have access to all the facilities of uh, the partners with this uh, equipment, with this tools, with this know-how um, to do this powering of the IoT. What we do there is in uh, sub-projects, we're doing studies, uh, um, on your on your wishes, we're doing simulations, build up of uh, demonstrators. Um, these are typical work um, for you, at least, doing characterization of uh, materials or uh, uh, some uh, build ups uh, to optimize them. Um, and one additional highlight is our database on uh, sorry on real life vibrational uh, energy sources. There you can use uh, much data for your own optimization and development designing of, uh, of the system. Yeah, so we are open to all academia and industry for yeah, nearly everybody, researchers, developers, integrators, all who want to take place, please uh, sign in and able if not done and ask us for these uh, special projects to help you um, to, to power and to uh, do developments of energy harvesting. Okay, then let's go into detail of our uh, yeah, today topics, the, uh, starting with some example of, uh, of it for a little warm up, uh, showing you some uh, things, uh, for example, medical implants where we use uh, electronics and sensors in inside the human body, uh, avoiding also their batteries, powering them from, from outside with RF. Or one uh, example here, the infrastructure monitoring, uh, having sensors on overhead lines. Yeah, that seems to be easy because it's uh, lots of power in such a line that can be harvested. On the other side, you have to consider uh, that's a wide range of current, even if there's uh, lighting uh, and these things in the line, you have uh, yeah, very high currents that, that we have to withstand. Everybody knows already the charging, the wireless charging of smartphones, for example. This is a standard already uh, yeah, for a long time on the market. Then we have here one example, retrofit current sensor that can be easier used to monitor uh, things and uh, to analyze currents in, in any machine or any, any equipment you have. And also in smart home applications, of course, you can use RF energy harvesting. The window, for example, can be also realized with these technologies, RF harvesting up to now. Sometimes only energy harvesting is used by solar cells, of course, yes, but not that much. It can be increased drastically also using this technology, but also RF uh, harvesting is one example in this area. Okay, so let's go a little bit more into detail. RF, of course, we have to do something with radio waves and frequencies. You know, all the ranges and the different frequency bands here from the from the low frequency often used in history for some purposes there. The HF, there's a famous NFC, RFID principle working as well as UHF. It's a nice band where you can reach much higher ranges for transferring this energy. Uh, but also there are some uh, future application in even higher frequencies. 
uh, the SHF uh, in uh, about six gigahertz and even EHF might be possible where something is going on with, uh, yeah, uh, beam steering might be, there's a lot of things are possible. So you see on the lower frequencies, we have in this area more inductive coupling. And on the higher frequency, we use the electromagnetic radiation uh, with these standard uh, antennas, you know, from other um, application. That's not quite a sharp uh, thing. Typical, uh, typical um, you set uh, up to 40, 40 megahertz. That's uh, mostly all um, uh, inductive. And on the higher side, you can also you can also work with magnetic field, but for energy transfer, it's often used in the electromagnetic. Um, radiation. So even from the wording here, we're talking here about uh, RF and inductive energy harvesting, uh, sometimes also the, the wireless uh, power transfer is used. Um, so that's from the meaning the same, we have to consider what are the devices to be powered. Uh, sometimes we have also higher, higher power, for example, charging of cars electric cars is also a wireless power transfer topic and uh, some some uh, other uh, things also but here the same in this way so let's start with the aligned coils that uh, picture is borrowed from the rfid i mentioned before it's very similar we have on on one end side the generator that means we are generating uh, the magnetic field uh, a part of this field is going through um, yeah, the receiver part, that means the device to be powered and uh, it's uh, antenna coil there. There is a voltage induced, it's rectified and used to operate um, the sensor here set uh, with chip. You see that it's coming here from RFID with an additional modulation uh, circuitry to <laughs> bring back some uh, some data on this but it doesn't matter here in this case if we are looking to yeah uh, some uh, geometries and some uh, uh, ranges for power transfer um, i've shown here this simple formula from the magnetic field from a coil from a circle coil, you see it here, the radius of L, uh, L1, that's a, a transmitter coil, and you have uh, this receiver coil L2. Um, to see first, uh, what's the, what's the, uh, yeah, the curve of the, the magnetic field over distance, you see it here calculated only as example for different types of transmitter coils from 20 to 60 centimeter, you see here. Uh, typically what's missing here, it's a line, what power is available in this. We will see this a little bit later. So uh, due from this curve, we can reach about, uh, depends a little bit on, on currents on the on this initial setup, uh, up to one meter. This is a very typical, you know, this also from some other um, application. One example here, we want to look a little bit deeper into is uh, from the medical and plant side here. We have shown here um, a sensor that's implanted into the human body. It's for measurement of pressure inside the brain. It's inside this uh, capsulation here. It's a hydrocephalus uh, disease. Um, that comes with a higher pressure um, inside the brain. And they have a so-called shunt system. Um, that's a fluid that is, uh, um, that bring the liquid, the overpressure liquid down to the, down to the body anywhere. And it's controlled by sensor system. For example, you bring in from, ex, uh, from external uh, with this inductive coupling, the power for, um, for the implant and to do the measurements there. So we have here measure, uh, sensors within the uh, implant. We can build it, for example, as a single chip solution. 
um, it has to be long-term stable. That's very critical in the human body. That's very aggressive from the media inside the body. So what's used here is a titanium capsulation. Titan titanium, of course, is metal. And metal and um, RF is very critical. So this is an example where we use also a low frequency because the low frequency uh, is able to go through a, a capsulation to a metal, in this case, titanium uh, capsulation to bring in the energy, uh, energy inside this capsul uh, capsulation. And we have here uh, operation example of 350 milliwatts. There's a, a range of, let's say, 10 centimeters in this example. 10 centimeters uh, operation um, is no problem at this rate. And uh, it has the ability for sampling rates up to 40 samples per second. OK, so for this example, then we go on with the transformer. How is this working? Um, here we are using a transformer around the cable for the energy harvesting, also the magnetic stray field of a conductor. Here we have a single uh, cable or a single conductor uh, that causes a magnetic field around when a current is flowing. And here we can have also sensors inside the sensor module connected to this transformer. Uh, having local intelligence. So here's a little bit more energy available due to the close coupling. Um, yeah, here we can do, for example, determination of machine conditions or some other energy values, what we have seen from the overhead line before, uh, temperatures, uh, currents, uh, inclination, uh, and these things, vibration. And then communicate, uh, for example, at machines with very low power, things or even other with uh, LoRa or um, other communication um, technologies. So the principle, of course, is the transformer. Transformer is known uh, very easy to handle with this uh, ratio of uh, turns, the secondary and primary. But if we are going to this special case, we have only one conductor, we don't have a turn um, on the first side, so that's not longer valid, these uh, uh, equations here, we have to look for some other things. So what's, what parameters are interesting here? Of course, we have the conductor. This is shown here as um, <laughs> a bigger one, but well, like mentioned, it can also be a uh, uh, yeah, light white and a, a small one. The current, the primary current, of course, in this line, uh, we have the frequency, of course, for this transfer. We have the core dimensions, very, very important because of the field around the um, um, around the conductor. We have these air gaps, for example, when we bring the conductor, uh, when we bring the core as a retrofit solution around the cable, then of course we have something like uh, air gaps. We have the core material. We have turns. We have the secondary current we need to have for the powering. These are um, the most important uh, parameters here. Uh, let's have a look to the, to the field over the distance. We have the conductor and we have the magnetic field uh, in the area of the core. Of course, it's a little bit higher due to the um, permeability of the core um, there. So for example, um, the range, if we have a primary current of one amp and a maximum of uh, 32 amp, then we have a dynamic range of one to 1,000. Maybe that's good handleable in the, <laughs> in the moment, but um, it can also be higher from the range here that has to be handled from the electronic side, of course, and from the dimensioning. Uh, so. Uh, then we have some issues with the um, saturation effects. If the current goes high, then we have uh, um, results, time dependent reduction, primary inductivity, um, harvest power is uh, yeah, compressed a little bit. So we have a um, yeah, good handleable solution here for using this uh, transformer 
for, for this energy harvesting. We can calculate it, of course, beginning with these simple uh, equations. I guess every one of you knows these uh, laws of the magnetic field around the corner. It's a little bit easier, like the mentioned one before from the coil. Together with these two, the uh, magnetic induction, it's only the factor of the permeability, and the magnetic flux, we have this um, d phi to dt to, to calculate the to calculate the voltage, the induced voltage on the secondary winding. And the, here we find our dimensions from the core again. And uh, from this, we can calculate um, yeah, the, uh, the in inductance um, of our um, transformer um, coils. Together with this, we can build it, this uh, equivalent circuit diagram. That's rather simple. We have only uh, the internal values of the series resistance and uh, uh, inductance and uh, yeah, the load resistance, of course. This has to be balanced here with the power adaption and there we can calculate then you, from our values um, what we need for the, um, what we need for the, for the power uh, to be harvested. This is an example what's uh, typical with these small sensors, uh, for example, in industrial application, this start at rather low currents, uh, below one amp, of course. Here we have, uh, uh, yeah, in milliamps, some, uh, some milliamps uh, available um, here, and we can uh, use this for, uh, yeah, supply of our sensor modules. So coming to the example um, for this transformer application, you see, you have seen it in the picture before. We have these uh, modules available uh, that can be used here for current um, uh, processing and uh, data acquisition for several purposes. I've seen a build uh, a figure here. We we are using it. Um, for switch drivers, uh, uh, for the wear of a switch drivers uh, at the railway. Um, here it detects um, yeah, the current and analyzes the current also by local embedded a a AI that's possible to bring it. Uh, with, the right, with the right dimensioning, you can with these uh, low current applications with the low cur uh, current drives, you can have up to let's say 100 milliwatt uh, of power that can be used um, uh, for, the, for the module. And that's uh, you know, compared to other technologies, a lot for, um, for powering these IoT devices. So um, yeah, of course you can combine it also with other sensors, uh, for example, um, yeah, current and uh, temperature and uh, inclination like mentioned before. So far, um, yeah, the topic of the uh, inductive harvesting, then I would like to hand over to Mammut who will go on with the next step of, uh, of the RF harvesting. Mammut, are you ready? Should we- I am. Uh, Thank you for the introduction, Gerd. If we can stop sharing, yeah, that would be great. Yes. We are good in time, I guess. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for listening, and thanks to Gerd for the introduction and the details of inductive power transmission and near field power transmission. So, this part of the webinar, I'll be focusing on the further away part of the spectrum, the far field power transfer, the microwave power transmission, or radio frequency power transmission. We've so far looked at inductive coupling as well as resonant approaches, but most of my talk will focus on the UHF spectrum. I'll briefly touch upon future applications, millimeter wave spectrum, and potentially even up to terahertz applications for power beaming. But most of my talk will be on the lower frequency range around the ultra high frequency spectrum. Just to give a bit of background, 
radio frequency power transmission is not an emergent technology. It's not something that someone came up with 10 or 15 years ago. In fact, it's older than the IoT and the internet itself. It is the beginnings of far field power transmission were in the 1960s. It was pioneered by William Brown from Racing Company for defense applications. And in the 1960s, in the photographs, there has been a demonstration of a drone that was being completely powered using radio frequency power transmission at three gigahertz with an end-to-end -end efficiency more than 30%, sorry, more than 13% and transmitting over 100 watts at 60 feet distance. So these numbers are very promising. They show that the technology work, but one of the reasons this didn't really make it into commercial applications is the fact that that didn't comply with, for example, health regulations and frequency spectrum allocation. So far field power transmission as we know it now, or at least for the Internet of Things concept, is much, it's much lower in power, it's much lower in gain, and it's much lower in efficiency as well. So for a bit of theoretical background to understand how things are going, far field power transmission builds on wireless communication theory. We have a power transmitter, which is fundamentally an antenna that radiates power based on its radiation pattern. And further away from the antenna, once in your far field, you receive a power density that is a function of your transmitter gain and how much power was coming from your amplifier into your transmitting antenna. As you can see in the power density equation, the power is inversely proportional to the distance squared, and that is due to the spherical spreading of the radio waves away from your transmitter. At your receiving end, we receive a plane wave or the incident power density, usually in the order of microwatt per centimeter square based on real regulations. And how much we receive is a function of the effective area of our antenna. The effective area is in turn a function of the antenna's gain, polarization, and the angular alignment between your transmitter and receiver. So if we substitute those into our power density equation, we get an equation that we're mostly familiar with, which is the free space path loss formula. You can clearly see from the equation that the amount of power you receive is inversely proportional to the distance because of the spherical spreading and also inversely proportional to the frequency because of the area loss on the receiver as your antennas appear to be smaller, higher frequency. Now to convert that into DC power, if we use some form of a rectifier circuit, and I'll talk about that in more detail, and how much DC power you get in the end is a function of the efficiency of the rectifier, which also depends on the input power and the devices you're using. That brings a question, we use wireless communication, so can we harvest the power that is being radiated for, from wireless communication? And usually the question, is that real? Is this power enough for the Internet of Things? And the answer, the brief answer is that yes, it is real, it could work, but only if your power budget is in order of one or two microwatts. So in figure one, we've got a very recent spectral survey that was carried out in Montreal in Canada in 2020. And you can see that in the main streets where you would expect to have very good phone coverage across the different bands, you'll have power density that is more than minus 20 dBm, or in other words, higher than 10 microwatts. But we need to keep in mind that this is RF power, which still needs to be converted, and your efficiency will most likely be less than 50%. In figure two, we've got an indoor measurement, which we have carried out here at the University of Southampton in the UK. And indoors, we found that the average power was about three microwatts, and the maximum power we had during the day was about six microwatts. Another key result we have in figure two is that when the polarization of the antenna was aligned with the polarization of the incident wave, we received enough power, about six microwatts, that when we had polarization misalignment, basically our antenna was 90 degrees rotated compared to the incident wave. We received very little power, which you can see in the red line, which is less than microwatts, one microwatts. So if we are to harvest power from ambient radiation in a random environment, then we need to be able to harvest two polarizations and some of the power in order to harvest anything substantial. Now, it doesn't sound like ambient RF energy harvesting is very feasible for most applications, but in fact, RF energy harvesting is very omnipresent in many commercial applications, and that is through UHF RFID. So in fact, there are more RF energy harvesters than humans from 2019 because every single UHF RFID tag, which you do find in retail and in barcodes, is effectively an RF energy harvester. The reader transmits power. If that power is high enough, it can turn on the tag. By turning on the tag, it basically overcomes the losses in the rectifier on the tag, which then backscatters its ID to the user using a simple transistor switch, which shorts and modulates the impedance of the antenna to reflect part of your wave. 
In most RFID tags, the tag is simply an antenna and a rectifier, which means that we can design the antenna directly to, to match the impedance of the rectifier, eliminating any external components and realizing a very low cost energy harvesting system. That brings us to rectifiers, which are usually considered the bottleneck of RF energy harvesting. At the low input power level side of the spectrum, which is what we're interested in for the IoT, we are limited by the forward voltage drop across the diodes. When your input signal is very low in power, the amplitude is very small. And if you compare that to the forward voltage drop across the bias junction, you will end up with a low efficiency at low power levels. As we go higher in power, the efficiency approaches the maximum efficiency achievable by your device, but then we get the limit of the breakdown voltage. That is when your output DC voltage saturates and your efficiency starts to drop exponentially because you cannot generate more DC power than what you have generated at this point. Impedance matching, both on the antenna end as the RF side and at the load, the DC load can improve the efficiency and help overcome the diode losses. So in here, we have a rectifier circuit, a simple voltage doubler circuit based on a commercially available short key diode. And the way we have modeled this system has been through antenna and rectifier co-design or basically nonlinear simulation. We model the antenna as a complex impedance source and we have our load impedance, which we model as a resistor, which mimics the current draw by an active circuit. And we optimize it in a nonlinear steady state simulation that combines the electromagnetic effects of your layout, your packaging parasitics, and also the nonlinear effects of the diode junction and the performance of the circuit. We simply treat the entire system as an RF black box. We have an input power level that we cannot control as a function of the antenna and the distance. And we have an output power level in DC, which we want to maximize in order to increase the energy harvesting efficiency. We feed that into an optimization algorithm and we get the maximum value, the, the optimum impedance that corresponds to the maximum efficiency that we're looking for. In here, we have the results of such systems. So in the right-hand side, you have the input impedance sweep. The excess is the imaginary part of your antenna impedance, basically the inductance. And the RS is the source resistance, which is basically the real impedance of your antenna. And you can see that once you have the optimum real and imaginary input impedances, you can achieve a very high power conversion efficiency compared to other antennas reported in literature. So for example, at 10 microwatts, we can achieve more than 40% efficiency, which means you get more than four microwatts DC power. So what does a rectenna look in real life when we do an antenna rectifier co-design? That gives us flexibility and it's all up to the antenna designer what your system will look like. So for example, when we eliminate the external matching component or large complex systems, we can entirely realize our systems using printed electronics or low cost materials, which can be flexible, can be conformable or even wearables. And in some cases, we could use them to support ambient energy harvesting. So in here, we have a rectenna that is operating at 900 megahertz. And we see it for harvesting power from a GSM phone. So you have a phone call, and then you can straight away see that the harvested voltage over resistive load goes up to around 600 millivolts. Obviously, that depends on how far away from the phone. It could depend on the alignment, which again gets back to our polarization issue, how well your antenna is aligned with the transmitter. But it's a demonstration that you can harvest ambient RF signals, not just from the downlink from a base station, but also from your uplink devices like your smartphone, which could be useful for wearable applications. Now, a different way to implement the rectennas is using standard antenna design and an impedance matching network. So far, we have embedded the matching network in the antenna itself and just worked with impedance straight away but we could divide and conquer our system into 250 ohm components, which makes it much easier to debug, makes it much easier to test using standard lab instruments. And to make it even simpler, we can start our work with a broadband antenna. The reason we choose a broadband antenna is that it's more resilient to the environment. So for example, if you put it in a case or a 3D printed enclosure, or even place it in a human body for a wearable application, the antenna detuning will not significantly affect its performance. It will still maintain its same impedance. And then you have your impedance matching for the rectifier to transform your 50 ohm impedance of the antenna to the desired high impedance of the rectifier achieved through standard low cost lump components like a single RF inductor, as you can see. And both the layouts of the antenna and the rectifier are relatively compact. So it's still a very simple approach and it could achieve the same very high power conversion efficiency as with antenna rectifier co-design. <laughs> 
So now when it comes to designing your own antennas, if you just want an RF energy harvester to power your own Internet of Things system, maybe you do not have the RF design experience or you do not have the resources in terms of software or instrumentation, there are lots of design literature which you could be looking at. In fact, there is the WISP computational RFID platform, which was developed by researchers from Intel, which combines a microcontroller from Texas Instruments, a rectifier, and a backscattering modulator with all the software and RF hardware available open source. I've got the link to the GitHub repository in the slides. It's a very good design and it's widely present in computer science literature and embedded systems literature as a platform where software developers develop their solutions based on RF energy harvesting. Or you can go down the route of designing your own RF circuits using open source software. In fact, there are open source simulation software for RF simulations which perform same simulation as commercially available software with even a very similar layout and very similar user interface. And there is a nice review of them available on Microwave 101 website. And finally, when it comes to lab instruments, RF lab instrumentation is usually expensive, but you can always get around it. 10 years ago, you, you would have to buy an expensive network analyzer, but now you can get those from eBay for about 100 US dollars, and they are sufficient, just a simple antenna. Software defined radio, you can use that for your transmission or you can simply buy your own power amplifier or make your own based on very cheap electronic modules from eBay or other retail. Future RF energy harvesting, semiconductors keep getting smaller, but antennas need to be comparable to the wavelengths. So we cannot shrink antennas in the same way we shrink semiconductors. So the way we do it, we increase the frequency. So we could go up to the millimeter wave spectrum when antennas start getting smaller. So you can see in figure one, we have a full RF energy harvester, a voltage doubler rectifier, and an antenna in an area that is about one centimeter square. Similarly, if we start getting closer to the trillion device dream 10 years from now, our Internet of Things devices and our wireless powered devices might start competing for bandwidth with our cellular networks. And that's when we will need broadband harvesters operating in the millimeter wave spectrum. So in figure two, we can see that a millimeter wave harvester implemented using low cost materials for wearables and textiles, as you can see in figure one, is still able to, to realize a very high DC voltage, admittedly from a high input power, more than 10 milliwatts, but at such a high frequency, it's a good demonstration that within 5G radiated power levels, we can use dual purpose base stations to transmit information and power to our future Internet of Things devices. So that is it for me on RF energy harvesting and far free power transfer, and I will hand it over to Peter on electrodynamic energy harvesting. Okay, thank you, Mahmoud. All right. Uh, so, good afternoon, everybody. I will now conclude this webinar talking about the electrodynamic harvesting. So here in the electrodynamic principle, we're using the magnetic field of permanent magnets and the combination with a coil to induce a current in the coil and use any kind of mechanical movement to generate electrical power. So the principle of such electrodynamic or the inductive generators is well understood. So it's the dynamo principle where we use a combination of coils and magnets uh, which are in near proximity and which are moved relatively to each other. So you see the principle on this um, uh, uh, right picture here with the permanent magnet and the coil. And on the lower picture, you see a practical implementation of a very famous company called Perpetuum. They're building such generators since a, a couple of tens of years. And they are quite um, popular in the business field of railway application. So these simple components like a, a coil and a magnet uh, allows that technology to really provide it in a cheap implementation. And also the principle is very well understood in, in research and in technology. So these components can be highly optimized. And since they are produced in large quantities, a cheap realization and implementation of jet generators are possible. So we can use any moving or rotating mechanical structure for uh, generating electricity. Here is one example which we used to um, really uh, generate electricity for powering a, a cellular uh, wireless transmission module. 
Uh, this picture shows a so-called oval wheel counter. An oval wheel counter is actually a flow measurement device, which is used for measuring the flow of, of different kinds of fluids like gasoline on oil. And in this oval wheel counter, we have two quack wheels uh, in a cavity in a in a uh, encapsulated housing. And if this oil is flowing or the fluid is flowing through this housing, these crack wheels are turned and each turn of these crack wheels is measured and uh, the, the number of turns is proportional to the flow through this oval wheel counter. These rotation of these crack wheels can also be used to generate electric power. So in this implementation, we applied additional magnets on these um, crack wheels and in the housing of the coil, which you can see on the right picture here, uh, we implemented uh, several coils. And if these magnets are moving relative to the coils to the flow of the fluid, uh, we get a current induced in these coils and these currents are then combined in a sophisticated uh, AC-DC converter and power management and then these uh, power uh, uh, are combined and they are used to, to provide a, um, a current to any kind of transmission module or any kind of sensor. So in this application, we are producing around 20 milliwatts at a flow rate of 50 liter per minute. And this was actually used to power a cellular uh, communication module to transmit uh, that measured data to a base station or to the internet. Actually, this was a, a formal research project with uh, two companies from Germany, Bob and Reuter Messtechnik and Vicon uh, GmbH. Another application of this electrodynamic harvesting uh, we are presently implementing in a, a mechanical tool. So in the performance of any kind of mechanical tool, can be improved by additional wireless sensors. And the idea here is to use these sensors to predict the maintenance and also use the sensor data to adjust the process parameters. So as you can see here on the right picture, we have sensors on a, on a, on a drilling tool and these sensors are measuring the migration during the operation. And these vibrations are a hint for the performance and for the state of health of the tool. And they can uh, show or give you a hint when this tool has to be removed or it, uh, exchanged. Uh, of course, in this rotating tool, there is no chance to apply any kind of cables or batteries, but the rotation can be used for generating electrical powers. So in this practical implementation, we are using magnets on the fixed part of this tool, which is called spindle or shaft, which you can uh, see later on in the next picture. And on the rotating part of the tool, so where the actual um, a drilling device is installed, we have coils. And if these coils are rotating relatively to the fixed parts, uh, so the magnets, then we have currents induced in these coils and of course, we have an additional electronic parts, power management on the tool, and we have a wireless transceiver, transceiver and um, vibration sensors. And this uh, uh, module measures the vibration during uh, the production, during the operation, and they are completely self-powered by the rotation of the tool. So here you can see a, a more detailed draft. We can see uh, in green, we have the coils and on the fixed part of the spindle, uh, we have the, the magnets. And if the complete tool is rotating due to the motor uh, of this drilling machine, we have a relative movement between the coils and the magnet and we have some energy induced in the coils on the moving on the rotating part. And we can use this energy to power any kind of sensors and uh, wireless transceivers. So the design and operation parameters, of course, they determine the power output and the functionality. Uh, of course, the power output is extremely uh, depending on the, on the turns ratio, which you can see here on the diagram. So we have power levels between one watt and up to 12 watts, depending on the revolutions per minute. A very critical design parameter is actually the distance between the 
coils and the magnets, because as you already seen in the presentations from my colleague, the distance uh, between uh, and these two components is uh, extremely determining the output power. And of course, uh, a way to uh, adjust this output power is the turns, uh, number of turns of these coils to really um, focus the system to the power needed or to the performance of the sensors and the wireless transceivers which are required in this application. So with this last picture, I like to uh, close our presentation. And now I'd like to hand over to my colleague, Nicolas, to guide you through the Q&A session. Thanks very much. Hi, Peter. Actually, um, Nicholas has gone off to another meeting, so I'm just going to handle this for you. Um, we'd like to thank everybody, including the speakers, Mahmoud, uh, Peter, and Gerd, for giving us an insight into the RF and inductive energy harvesting. And we'd like to invite any questions from the floor initially, and then we'll come back uh, with what we received ahead of the today's event. So if anybody uh, listening in at home there has any questions, I'd invite you to turn on your microphone and ask the panel live, if you wish. Hello, everyone. Uh, Hassan Shirazi here. Uh, I have a question from Mahmoud, uh, if possible. Uh, I was just wondering if uh, the energy transmitted by RF, uh, dedicated RF transmitter, uh, can interfere the data communication of the IoT device that we intend to charge. What would you comment on the interference if they are operating on the four ends, for, for instance? If the dedicated RF dedicated chargers, uh, if they are nine months, they are operated on nine months, five megahertz. And uh, uh, as you know, in, in the United States, this is the same band uh, uh, used by many of the IoT devices. So, would it actually interfere the communication and, uh, uh, you know, the data and energy? Yep. It, interference could definitely be a problem if communication happens at the same band, but only in a certain situation. So in a wireless communication system, how well you recover your information is dependent on your signal to noise ratio. And in most cases, the power difference between your modulated signal and the power transmission signal is going to be quite substantial based on what you're receiving. And in most cases, again, you will be receiving two separate antennas. So in that case, your own receiver might be able to, in, to cancel that interference. So even if that is operating in the same band. We have actually done work on simultaneous information and power transfer systems. So we have developed antennas that operate at the same band as a rectifier. So we have, for example, a dual port antenna, which in one port you have standard 2.4 gigahertz communication, for example, for Bluetooth. And on the other port, we have a 2.4 gigahertz rectifier. And based on antenna design, we have seen that we could have isolation between the communication and the information transfer of more than 30 dB. So in other words, the poles do not see each other. You could be creative with how you transmit your waves. You could do it over orthogonal polarization. So you could give your vertical polarization for communication and horizontal for energy harvesting, for example. So that's another way of overcoming this problem. All right. And if what do you think about the distance uh, between the optimal distance between the dedicated RF transmitters and the IoT devices? Because if you keep on increasing the distance, there uh, there would be obviously an impact on the the power magnitude we are receiving at the IoT devices. Uh, but uh, on on the other hand, uh, if you're quite closer, the, the magnitude, power magnitude would, would be better, but the, the probability of interference goes higher, no? It does increase the probability of interference, but at that point, your main priority is getting the power to the device. So in any wireless power scenario, you're not going to be operating in most cases at more than 10 meters, unless you have a very special rectifier and integrated circuit that you have designed for that system. But if using off-the-shelf components, your operation range would be limited by your rectifier. And at that point, your transceiver will always be able to work out your signal because the signal to noise ratio will be suitable for its standard sensitivity. Thank you very much. Any other questions there? 
Actually, I see there's one question on the chat line. Would anybody like to just have a look at that? Also for Mahmoud. Yep, so first question, I have a question about RF energy harvesting as part of applications. We'll target frequency extended design. Yeah, in, in a smart home application, realistically, the best approach would be something similar to your Wi-Fi based station, that is a wireless charging based station. I must say that in the UK, we are more restricted than the US when it comes to frequency bands. So for example, in the US, there's Powercast, which sell dedicated wireless charging hardware that operates at 950 megahertz. We have got stricter restrictions at 915, and it's only allowed for RFID readers in very strict regulations based on the EU standards. Harvesting ambient signals in and house will be quite difficult because, as we have shown in our indoor measurements, your power density is three to four, three to four microwatts of RF power. So if you want that to power an IoT device, you need to have a very good rectifier that's designed for that power level. And also you need to have a very low power system that is probably based on custom hardware. So my answer to the second question on the choice of frequency, we found that the 915 megahertz or 868 if you're in Europe to be the most realistic for far field power transfer. And we were able to charge devices as far as five meters to decent voltages, like two volts in a supercapacitor with a standard wearable rectenna. Mm -hmm. okay. RZ about um, smart home sensors. So there's a further question on the antenna gain. Is a low gain antenna better? In most cases where you don't know your incident wave direction, yes, a low gain antenna is better because it's omnidirectional. And it gives you more likelihood of receiving your power. So in fact, in some of our analytical studies, we found that a lower gain antenna will always outperform a higher gain, higher frequency antenna, just because if you introduce a random variation of your angular coverage, then the lower gain antenna will have a higher probability that could be over 10 times compared to its higher gain, higher frequency counterpart. The main motivation on the other hand to go to higher frequencies would be the better end-to-end -end efficiency, more like point-to-point -point links rather than an omnipresent cover for an entire area or an entire house. And there's one more there from Aldo. We've got a question here on far field energy harvesting at high distances over 10 meters besides power. The voltage developed at the rectenna is an important parameter to allow the start of a battery circuit. Yeah, definitely voltage is a bottleneck. In several cases, harvested power may be sufficient, but the voltage may not. What are possible RF front end design techniques and trade offs to maximize the available voltage in the RF regime before DC conversion? Yeah, as much as possible, we try and do things before DC conversion. And my answer to that would be mostly as a rectifier design. So I've got some references from literature on rectifier design. When it comes to that 10 meter range, we're looking at 10 microwatts or less. So we're operating in the minus 20 to minus 30 dBm threshold. And that's usually when commercial RFID chips stop working. But there have been this recent implementation in the literature, which you can now see in my slides, which have shown rectifiers operating as low as minus 30 dBm and still able to generate more than one volt. This is basically achieved through many, many stages of voltage multiplication using devices of very low threshold. So either you use a process which has low voltage threshold transistors, like the reference in my slides, or alternatively, you can use new topologies like cross-coupled rectifiers, which basically use your incident signal to cancel the threshold of the transistors. And this will allow you, if you stack many stages of your voltage multiplier, each stage having a very low voltage drop, to be able to generate as much as one volt below minus 30 dBm's from basically one microwatt of power. As far as the load is concerned, that depends on you having a mega ohm impedance load, which is basically a microamp or even nanoamps current draw, but that could be enough to sustain a system that is sleeping, for example, or just doing memory retention. In the higher power region, we've actually found that eliminating the power management stage could improve the end-to-end -end efficiency so when we were trying to charge a supercapacitor directly using our antenna, we found that the best efficiency could be achieved if you eliminate the power management stage, which does have its own quiescent current and also has its own inefficiencies. So once your power density is high, once you are below four meters between your transmitter and receiver, it's, it's best to operate without a power management circuit, which also reduces your cost and complexity quite significantly. And another one in there from Yanatan about in general what the challenges are in this field in the coming years? So 
So I'll answer that first for RF and far field. The main challenge is going to be still improving the rectifiers. It's going to be basically trying to shift that curve we have in figure two to the left, how we can improve our power output from smaller input. This is how we're going to increase the range of the devices. The other challenge would be how this scales, how it fits with other networks and how it interferes with, for example, cellular networks or even communication as the IoT nodes and how it can coexist with other wireless communication infrastructure. And there's one last one before we go on to the ones we received previously from Laurent there about um, taking into account if one street of residents are using GSM or F harvesting. Yeah, I think that that point about the losses in cellular network gets back to the answer of the previous question is how will RF energy harvesting interfere with networks? We do not have a certain answer because no one has ever tested a scenario or 10,000 RF powered devices and then use them to power your networks. But the answer is it might not affect the transmitted power, but if you deploy many RF energy harvesters, it, you may get with shadowing at some point. So you might end up with the RF energy harvesting shielding certain areas of the city that block the RF radiation from getting to the actual users, the smartphone or the cellular communication users, the people who paid for that power to be transmitted in the first place. So perhaps if one day we found that there are millions of RF powered devices harvesting or stealing power from cellular communications, we might find that regulations have stopped that and they only allow antennas to operate in ISM bands, for example, where you pay for your own power, you transmit your own power, and then you harvest it again, rather than parasitically feeding on wireless networks power. Okay. Thanks, Mahmoud. Um, if you stop sharing, I'll put the, um, yeah. the questions uh, you received previously up. Thanks. Now, so in advance of today's webinar, we did ask for uh, questions to be submitted. So maybe Peter or Gerd have some answers for these as well as Mahmoud. Yeah. So the first question is answered, right? Mm -hmm. The next one, resonant-based wireless power be discussed. Yes, the, the first principle with the line coils of the inductive harvesting is a, is a resonant-based principle. Yeah, that has been shown. That has been shown for this uh, example of the human implant, for example. Uh, yeah, example. Mm -hmm. Related to specific absorption rate when powering the implantable device, which can lead to tissue heating. Um, yeah, perhaps I can I can uh, say something about this. May I share at all? So can you sure. release? So perhaps let me share. Um, um, yeah, influence of human body. You have the tissue, you have the, uh, the field going into the body that causes eddy currents due to, yeah, due to the field. And these are losses that means heat up. So how is it, how can it be uh, quantized there? What can we do to, to calculate losses and from this doing heat up? Um, so what we have as experience is uh, from the frequency, first checking what is the best choice for bringing power into the human body. You have the low, fre low frequency, the low frequency mentioned with these 125 or 100, 30 kilohertz, uh, these very low frequency, they will have nearly no influence of, um, of the tissue and the water in it and all these things. Uh, from, the, from the physical side, you can use this, of course. Uh, we have done it also for this application with the um, uh, metal um, housing 
with this capsulation there, there is uh, from the tissue side, no problem. Uh, if we are going up to higher frequency, higher frequency are much better in the sense of uh, power transfer because of the uh, dV to dt, that means uh, uh, the induction is much better. So the coil can be much smaller. You can use printed coils as antenna coils for, uh, for receiving the data. So that it makes sense to do it on, um, uh, on these higher frequency. We have also these uh, HF bands there uh, available. Uh, so we have done calculations uh, and uh, simulations and measurements, of course. Simulations, you can uh, have these models uh, ready. You can buy them for the simulation and doing simulation on this and see what's going on. So we have done this in this um, frequency range um, from, uh, from here 0 to 40 megahertz, this inductive, this inductive modeling here. You, we have chosen the several models to see the, sorry, that's not all in English, <laughs> we'll translate it here on the left side, we have the ratio from the model to air, Luft is air. Um, you see here the inhomogeneous model, that's one from this uh, uh, modula uh, simulation model. The homogeneous model, that's a quite more simple one, and we have done measurements with a phantom that's uh, that's a, a kind of material that is mixed together to have a similar behavior of the tissue. So you see here in this left curve, the, um, the blue curve and the, and the dotted line and the measurements point, the, um, the black points that's uh, going together. And you see um, here the, the ratio of the induced voltage um, at the receiver side, but this different frequency, you see the 6.89 megahertz frequency uh, is a band available, the 13.56 uh, band is the NFC band uh, that's used here. And if you change a little bit, uh, the ratio you put in and uh, what you receive, this ratio on the right hand side, um, over the frequency you have here, this area around the available bands with these uh, different models. So, um, so the losses are not that high. You can really have good transfer of, uh, um, of the energy into the human body. Uh, we have built up um, here, uh, solutions for a simple for a simple sensor for deeply implanted sensors for the heart for example you have to you have to reach distances of about 30 to 40 centimeters if you will reach more or less all <laughs> available um, sizes of uh, uh, of the thorax of uh, of the people and you can use this in this band uh, of 30.56 uh, megahertz um, under the, uh, the limitation, the boundary conditions uh, due to regulations. Uh, and you have coils, very small. You can uh, use their um, uh, simple air coil of a diameter of, uh, of about uh, 10 millimeters diameter of the coil that are rather small dimension, they are reachable there. So what we learn is from the warming up, we don't see the warming up of the tissue due to this radiation of, uh, of uh, uh, the magnetic field. What we see, of course, is uh, the heating of the electronics. Of course, this is also an effect you have to consider if you want to have an approval of the sensor as a medical implant, we have done it for this for this heart, uh, um, for this brain sensor I mentioned before. Uh, that's rather criti critical if you uh, have from the power range too much power that heats up the electronic, you have to find a way to, to avoid this heat up. Uh, that's more critical um, in the designing of the system as the heat up of the tissue in this frequency range.
That's what we learned. Okay. Thanks, Greg. Um, so, yes, I will stop here. Okay. You show you the last uh, two, I think. So we're here. Uh, what is the most reliable model to predict the energy available to be inductively harvested in body? Yeah, I think that's answered. Uh, that we have these uh, these model I've presented there together with a simulation um, that uh, brings very good very good results. Okay. What I've explained before on the slides. Okay, and the final one there, the RF front end, including antenna design criteria. Are there any? I suppose guidelines. Yeah, I think the main guideline is obviously the frequency bandwidths, whether you're directly matching your antenna to the rectifier or you're matching your antenna to a matching network and then matching that to the rectifier. Then you need to make sure you have your impedance bandwidths. And as I discussed with broadband antennas, it's always nice to use a broadband antenna if you can afford it in terms of area in your system to improve your resilience to the surrounding and make sure your system is more robust and more reliable. Whether it's directional, high gain antenna, or an omnidirectional antenna, that again depends on your application and environment. So there's no right answer to what radiation patterns you need, but there's always the right answer that you need a high antenna efficiency as much as possible, because that relates to the total radiative power, which is what you're interested in. Thanks, Mahmoud. There's just one last question now. We'll finish at this because we've gone over time, but there's been a lot of interesting ones um, in the chat there. Uh, can you comment on the impact of RF transmitters of five watts on the human health if people are quite close within five meter range to the RF transmitter? I can comment on that if you can stop sharing. I actually have a slide on yeah, that topic. Sure. So we haven't actually worked with five watts, but we have been very close at four watts in our experiments. And we usually done our analysis on the receiver side as in for, for, because we have been working with wearable RF energy harvesting. So in that case, you have an antenna that is sitting on the body, as you can see in figure one, and that antenna will collect your power and basically can cause local heating and local specific absorption rate, going back to the previous question on that, in that area. So in figure one, we can see an antenna that's receiving 20 dBNs. That is basically 100 milliwatts. So that is probably going to be at less than one meter from a five watt source. And we can see that the specific absorption rate for an antenna worn directly on the body is less than half a watt per kilogram. Now, to put that in perspective, the regulations are around 1.7 watts per kilogram for smartphones, for example. So the radiated power is not going to cause any heating or extra effects compared to smartphones. For magnetic resonance, which you can see in figure two, the specific absorption rate is significantly lower. It's about 17 times lower than the regulations, even though we are radiating, or sorry, we are coupling half a watt of power through the human body. So in a way, we can see that as long as you are receiving power in the milliwatts region, it is very safe for human use. Okay. Thanks for that answer. Um, we're just gone over the hour and 10 minutes, so we might leave it there. First of all, I'd like to thank all the speakers, um, Peter, Mahmoud, and Gerd. And I'd like to thank everybody out there in the audience for staying with us and being encouraged by the different presenters. Uh, if there's anything about Enables that has come up that's of interest to you, or you want to know a bit more about the program, um, please visit our website. Um, it's enables-project.eu, and you'll get more information there. And I just see that we have an open event coming up uh, in May. Peter, would you like to say anything about this? Sorry, you mentioned me, Paul. Well, yeah, I'm just wondering, would you like to say anything about the, the next event? Yes, of course. That's our um, virtual conference with the focus on powering the IoT, where we have around eight to 10 speakers, all dealing with uh, technologies, focusing on energy harvesting, um, energy storage and micropower management. We have some partners from the Enables Network which actually talk about uh, real-world use cases. They will introduce the results of finished transnational projects. And we have some promising uh, keynote speaker, as we have Roy Freeland from Perpetuum and Dennis Passero from Elika, uh, 
and a couple of other interesting speakers. We will also have a panel discussion on relevant topics uh, focusing on energy harvesting, uh, energy storage, and micropower management. So the registration is open. The preliminary list of speakers is available on the website, and the agenda will be uh, published at the end of next week. Thanks.